Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we are going to be entering some haunted houses for some truly spooky experiences. So get ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. In 2003, I lived in the southwestern part of Virginia, in the US, in a small mountain town. The town had been a coal mining town for generations, and had been around since the 1800s. After living in the basement of my girlfriend's mother's house for over a year, we decided it was time to get our own place. The place we had chose to rent happened to be the second home we looked at. It was a two-story brick home that had been around for well over a hundred years. It was conveniently located across the street from a bank, restaurant, and grocery store. The current owners had remodeled the home to have an apartment on the ground floor and another on the upper floor. The apartment we chose was the ground floor apartment, and although it was $50 more a month, we didn't mind. We signed a one-year lease and moved in. As we settled into our new home, things couldn't have been better. No one lived in there in the other apartment, and it was incredibly peaceful considering its location. For the first month, things were normal aside from the small little creaks and noises that were associated with the noises of an old home. One night, things changed, as fast as the flip of a coin. Sitting in our living room and watching TV, we began to hear defined footsteps walking around in the upstairs apartment. At first, I thought that someone must be moving in upstairs, and we both got excited to see who our new neighbors were. We decided we should go sit on our shared front porch and wait for an opportunity to introduce ourselves. After an hour or two, we gave up and went inside and bedded down for the night. For the next week, we continued to hear someone walking around, but never saw our new neighbors. At this time, I worked a job that had me working various different shifts. One particular night, I got home and my girlfriend asked if I could maybe talk to our neighbor about all the noise we were hearing. I obliged and went to knock on the door. After knocking a few times, no one answered and I gave up. I stepped out front for a cigarette and had a realization that I never saw a moving truck and no new vehicle was parked out front. And perhaps even more strange, the lights in the apartment never appeared on at night. At the end of the second month, as I dropped off my rent to the landlord, I asked about our new neighbors and was told the apartment hadn't been rented yet. I told our landlord about the noises. He said that wild animals must have gotten in somehow and he would stop by and look at the situation. He came by on a Saturday and we looked around the empty upstairs apartment and couldn't find a sign of anything. He told me it must be the noise of an old house, and I just had to accept that. I knew there had to be more going on, but I saw for myself that nothing could be making those noises. Life continued, and so did the footsteps. A few weeks later, we had some friends over for dinner, when the footsteps started again. My best friend started to remark about how loud our neighbors were, and I filled him in on what was going on. He was convinced that someone must be breaking into that apartment at night. With a little bit of liquid courage, we found a creative way to get the door open and went in to inspect. Once again, the apartment was empty, and I was at a loss. We locked up the vacant apartment, and that is when the conversation came up about the house possibly being haunted. And this was something that we would just have to accept. This conversation went on for a few hours between myself and girlfriend and our two best friends. In retrospect, I wish this conversation and exploration never happened, as the following day everything got worse. Our friends got up the next day and headed home. We decided to walk across the street to the grocery store and spent the next hour shopping. Upon returning home, we unlocked the door and walked into our apartment to discover every door and cabinet in the house standing wide open. This sent chills up my spine. From this point forward, we had a routine of checking everything before we left home. Every time we came home, everything was wrong. 
we experienced doors being opened that were closed, and lights or fans would turn on or off on their own. This wasn't an electrical issue, as the switches themselves would be flipped. The more that this happened, the more concerned we became. But we were under a lease, and although the events were strange, it didn't seem malicious. So, we stayed. As days went on, it escalated. One evening I was sitting in our spare bedroom, which is where our computer is located. My girlfriend comes walking in and asks what I need. Me being confused by this, I ask what she means, and she says she heard me call her name. I told her that I had not called for her, and she accused me of trying to prank or scare her. The following night, I am back in the spare bedroom, and I hear her call my name. I got up, and went to see what she needed. She hadn't called me and again accused me of trying to scare her. At this point, I am starting to get really concerned as disembodied voices can't be a good thing. This continued for a long time as we lived there, and it got to the point that my girlfriend would say my name and I would ignore her, as I thought it wouldn't be her at first. For most, this probably would have been enough, but yet we stayed. After about four months of living there, we received a knock at the door. I answered and was greeted by a nice lady that was around the same age as myself and my girlfriend. She stated that she had lived there before the remodeling, and how much nicer the apartment looks. We agreed that it was nice, but asked her if she ever experienced anything odd while living there. She quite frankly said, Oh, you mean the ghosts? Yes. We were talking about ghosts. She stated that the house was definitely haunted, and she used to contact the ghosts on a Ouija board when she lived there. Then she asks if we would be willing to move into the upstairs apartment and let her have our apartment, as she wanted to move back to the home but couldn't handle the stairs due to her being pregnant. I politely declined as my girlfriend was partially disabled after a car accident, and we chose this apartment specifically due to that. I could tell the girl was disappointed in hearing this, but she was cordial and gave us her number in case we changed our minds, or if we decided to move, so that we could let her know. For the next month, things continued. They didn't escalate, but didn't get better either. At this time, the girl who appeared in our door a month ago was back, and she informed us that she was moving into the upstairs apartment and appealed to us again to switch apartment. We politely declined. She proceeded to move in. For the next month, things seemed to be getting better. Neither of us heard the voices, the issues with the doors and lights stopped, and any footsteps upstairs could now be justified. Just as we got used to normal life in the house, the activity started again. But now it was worse than ever. Now we had to deal with all the issues from before, and now new things were happening too. At times, you would feel breathing on the back of your neck, only for no one to be behind you. We started seeing shadows move out of the corner of our eyes, and began to have issues with light bulbs burning out prematurely, and batteries and devices draining at an unexplainable rate. At this point we had less than six months left on our lease, and decided that we were moving when our lease ended. The experience we had in this apartment had put a massive strain on our relationship. At this point in time, my girlfriend was doing everything in her power to not stay in the house alone while I was working. On multiple occasions she went to her mum's house and stayed there for days at a time. Every time she stayed at her mum's, she asked me to stay with her instead of staying in the house alone but that would have added an hour to my commute each day. I would be lying if I said I wasn't scared, but I did it anyway. One morning I woke up after a long and mostly sleepless night. As I lay in bed trying to wake up, I hear footsteps in my apartment, and I know that I'm home alone. As I quietly get out of bed, I see my girlfriend walk past the bedroom door. This surprised me, as I didn't expect her to be there. I get up, and walk in to find out what she is doing home, and realize that she isn't there. I frantically call her and explain that I just saw her in the apartment. She tries to calm me down, but explains that it wasn't her, as she was still at her mum's house over a half hour away. Now I am scared, and feeling alone. I decided this was too much, and appealed to my girlfriend to please come and stay with me. 
I wouldn't have the strength to do it alone. She declined and said that the ghosts and or demons don't care about numbers. And to deal with my stress, I turned to smoking weed so that I could relax. But it didn't relax me at all. If anything, it only elevated my anxiety. It did, however, help me sleep. So I made it a routine before going to bed. One night, the guy who I used to buy my green off stopped by to drop some off. I gave him my address and told him to knock when he got out there. Instead of getting a knock on the door, I get a phone call from him. He says that he's out front and that I shouldn't be sitting at home alone and I should come hang out with him for a while. I agree and head out the door to meet him, get in his car and as we pull away, he tells me to move out of that place now. I of course asked him why and he said that if he told me everything he knew about that place, I would never step foot in there again. I pushed for more, but he wouldn't tell me. I am now truly terrified, but also curious as to what happened in the house. At this point, I had two months left on the lease. I'm spending every night online looking for info about the house. And one night, a guy I work with came by to help me search. I was amazed how much he helped me discover in such a short period of time. We found the age of the house, a picture of the home that was so old the main street in front of my house wasn't a road but instead a railroad track. We also found a news article talking about a fire in the house and the death of the occupant during the fire. Once we found this article and started to read it, we both began to hear the voices of what sounded like 10 kids playing on my front porch. I jumped up to look to see what was going on, and the moment I opened the front door the noise stopped. And obviously, there was no one there. My friend from work was so freaked out by this he left immediately, and refused to ever step foot in the house again. At this point I am now volunteering for overtime, just so that I don't have to be home. One day I came home to find a moving truck sitting out front, and my upstairs neighbour was moving out, as the stairs were adding complications to her pregnancy. She informed me her mother would be by the following day to pick up the last few items that were left. This night was strange, due to how peaceful everything suddenly became. No noise, no voices, nothing. That had to be the best night's sleep I had had in ages. The following day comes and I'm outside mowing the lawn, when the mother of the other tenant arrives. I'm greeted by her and we talk briefly about her daughter and the soon-to-be baby. After a few moments we parted ways and she went inside to gather the rest of her daughter's belongings. I offered to help but she declined. So I decided to stick close by just in case. After two trips to her car, she looked at me and stated that she only had a few pillows left to load up and how she couldn't wait to walk out of that creepy house for the final time. We had conversations previously about the haunting, you see. About two minutes after she went inside, I heard a scream and the sound of something tumbling down the steps. I went to investigate. The mother had apparently fallen down the steps. As I went to help her, she asked me to get her away from the house and said something forcefully pushed her down the steps. I helped her to the car, and she asked if I could grab the pillows that she dropped as she fell. She stated that if I didn't feel comfortable, that they could just stay behind. Attempting to be Mr. Macho Man, I told her I'd get them for her and proceeded back in. I reached the top of the stairs, grabbed the pillows and ran back down, and I slammed the door closed and returned to the mother. She was visibly shaken, and had a bruise appearing, and I asked if she wanted to go to the hospital but she declined, and asked if I would drive her and her car home. She said that she would have her husband bring me back. I knew she was in no shape to drive so agreed, and after a short ten minute journey I dropped her off, and her husband returned me to the house. Now I really am alone in the house, and I know it can hurt people. That night before I went to bed, I stepped out on the front porch for a cigarette. As I go back inside, I notice the door to the upstairs apartment is standing wide open. One half of me wanted me to just pull the door closed while the other half of me thought I needed to make sure no one was up there. I knew that I had closed the door earlier, and I feel like, if it had been open, that I would have noticed during one of my many times outside that evening. Ultimately, I decided to go upstairs and check everything out. As soon as I arrive to the top of the stairs, I hear an unnatural voice say, Leave. 
I ran down the stairs as fast as humanly possible, locked the door to the upstairs apartment and returned to my apartment more scared than I have ever been. After tossing and turning for several hours, I finally managed to fall asleep. When I awoke the next day, my front door was standing wide open. I had two locks, one on the doorknob and a deadbolt that could only be operated from the inside of the apartment. Both locks were in the locked position, yet the door was standing wide open. I'm losing my mind at this point. Having around five weeks left on the lease, I don't feel safe here at all. I know I'm not spending an entire day in the house alone, so I decided to shower and get ready to leave for the day. When I turned the water on, nothing happened though. I called the landlord, as water was included in the rent. I went to the back porch to call him while I smoked and realized that the stairwell going into the basement is filled with water. I call the landlord and he states he's out of town and that he keeps a key to the basement hidden in each of the apartments in case of emergency. I get the key, shut off the water to the house, and while doing so, realized that a plastic or PVC pipe had broken. I knew I could fix it, so I offered to do so. The hour that I spent in that basement was horrible. Nothing happened while down there, but I was totally creeped out. I got a very strange feeling that I was being watched, or that something was going to jump out and attack me. I finished the job and finally got my shower. I decided to go to my girlfriend's mum's house for the night as I was far too stressed. The following day after I got off work, I went back to the apartment with a realization that I only have a month left in that place. I had dinner that night, sat down and watched TV, and in the middle of my show, my TV went black. Then it flashed white. Then it all went black. All for the letters D I. E. This lasted for about five seconds and the TV powered off on its own and then would not switch back on. The following day, I dropped the TV off at a repair shop on my way back to work. The TV was just a little over a year old and after I got off, I swung by the repair shop and was informed they couldn't find anything technically wrong with it, but that it wouldn't power on. This was the final straw. The following day, I went to the bank and applied for a small home loan that was approved. I only entered that apartment one more time, the day I moved out. The experiences I had there have stuck with me, and although I have lived in many different places in my life, no place sticks in my mind like that one does. I feel lucky that I was never physically hurt, but the mental toll of something like this can stick with you forever. When I was around 12, I lived in a new high-rise building with my family that felt a little… off. Several times when I was able to convince my parents that it's okay to go out and leave me to watch TV alone, I would start hearing voices coming from the direction of the bedrooms that were identical to my family members, as well as the distinct sounds of my mother's high heels, clear as day. There was also this one time where I woke up very early in the morning, woke over to the sitting room to watch a show that only aired at that particular time. 15 minutes after sitting on the sofa, I started hearing a knocking sound on the glass window a few meters behind me. Now, we lived three floors up. There were no trees or wires or anything that could touch the glass, no sill for birds to stand on, and no other buildings in front of the window either. The knocking kept going for a good 10 minutes, before it suddenly stopped. I was too terrified to turn and look. It never happened again, during that time, or any other time of day. The apartment also had a small guest bathroom that was shaped like a narrow corridor. When you stepped in, there were two sinks on your right, and a small room at the end of the door, with the toilet itself. That little room scared the bejesus out of everyone. It was fine when you were using it and in it, but the moment you turned your back or were leaving it, this intense sense of absolute fear would set in every fiber of your conscious being and scream run. We moved out a year later and thankfully never saw what was causing the noises. Still boggles my mind thinking about it considering there was nothing on that land before the building was erected. 
Me and my brother are now both in our thirties, and the topic of the bathroom came up. Before I told him how I felt, he said he was also terrified of going in there, though no one ever said anything about it at the time. To give some background, we are a young professional couple in our late twenties, and this happened three years ago. Personally, I've always believed in the paranormal, as I've had a few experiences growing up. My dad also works as a medium and paranormal investigator. He taught me to always to be skeptical and look for a logical explanation. But my upbringing also gave me an open mind. In contrast, my partner Andy is not a believer in anything like that. He can sometimes be quite scathing on the whole subject. We were looking to move closer to my work in a town called Stroud in the county of Gloucestershire. England. We had two cats, so it was hard to find a landlord that accepted pets. We saw this gorgeous property become available after a month of searching. It was a 16th century cottage on the outskirts of town. It had been used as a mill hop in the 16th and 17th century, and had then been turned into a residential property around the mid-1800s. As soon as we went inside, we fell in love with it. It had two large downstairs reception rooms, a spacious kitchen, and three big bedrooms upstairs. There was also a strange little door under the stairs that led to an enormous basement area. Walking around during the viewing, I did feel a little on edge, as the atmosphere in an upstairs bedroom and the front room downstairs felt a bit heavy. I reminded myself that it was probably just in my head, and we went ahead and put the deposit down to make it ours. On our moving day, the landlord met us and talked us through everything. He mentioned that the staircase was not original, and that it had been taken from a theatre in Oxfordshire and installed in the house. He was very good at working with wood. This might seem like a random fact, but we later had experiences on that staircase, so I do wonder if it held any residual energy. We moved in, and it was as stressful as any moving day was. We were both knackered by the evening, and once the bed was up, we agreed to have an early night. We chose a back bedroom as our main one, the one I heard felt the heavy atmosphere in, as it was the biggest, and you couldn't hear the road from there. The house was right on a main road that led up to the Cotswolds Hills. We are lying in bed chatting when I felt the atmosphere change and get heavy and dark. I said as much to Andy, who told me I was just tired. Then slowly I started to see small slivers and blue lights appear in the air. They were about the size of a 5p coin, and would appear gliding slowly through the air, leaving a glowing after trail behind them. I pointed them out to Andy, and was surprised when he said that he could see them as well. As we were facing away from the road, I don't think it could have been car headlights, and they moved in arcs and erratically anyway. This lasted for about 10 minutes, and then they slowly faded away and the atmosphere lifted. I was surprised that we had both witnessed it. Andy took a picture, which you can see on screen. From that day, we started to have small little things happen around the house. One of the most common was to hear footsteps walk up and down the stairs and landing. This scared me very much when I first heard it, as I would often be home in the evening and would be alone when I did. It was loud enough for me to think it was a burglar and to hide in the back room and call Andy. Of course, when we checked, no one was there. It was certainly too loud a noise for our cats to make, and we believed they were downstairs with me at the time anyway. Another occurrence was that objects and ornaments would be moved around. We would find heavy ornaments carefully placed on the floor, and also in the hallway, a whole room away from where they had been originally. I also used to randomly find large pine cones placed on the stairs and on the sofa. We were not near any pine trees, and did not own any pine cone ornaments. This was all bearable, but I did feel uncomfortable on my own, especially in the front room of the house, which was a long, panelled reception room with a big fireplace. The fireplace had a heavy iron grate that we also would come home to find moved across the room seemingly by itself. 
it always seemed like someone was standing in the corner of the room watching me. I felt silly saying this to Andy, but at a later date, he also said that that particular corner made him feel watched. A year went by with these small strange things happening. We were mostly unconcerned with it, until the activity seemingly started to get more intense. One of the first things to happen was the basement door started opening by itself. This was strange as it had a knob you had to physically turn to open, and then pull it quite hard. It would also jam quite easily, and I had to get a knife to unjam it often. We would then come down in the morning, and it would be wide open, sometimes with the basement lights on too. Our electrical also seemed to go haywire at this point. My partner had a computer tower in our bedroom, with a large push-down button that you had to hold down to turn it on. It made a loud, very characteristic whoosh sound when it started up. It started to turn itself on quite often, noticeably at 5am, when we were both asleep. I'm a very light sleeper, so it would always wake me up. Now we have kept that computer in motion, since and it has not turned itself on in that manner. The TV would turn itself on though, as would the lamp that we kept in our bedroom. I would wake up to the light being on full whack. It had an adjustment slider. Our bedroom window would also open itself in the middle of the night. It had a heavy latch that I could hear unhook itself, and it would then swing open and crack loudly against the side of the house. When we first moved, our bed was directly under this window, which made me uncomfortable for some reason. Hearing and seeing it open in the night was incredibly unnerving. We did then move the bed, and I felt a little more comfortable afterwards. One of the scariest things was that we would start to hear voices around the house. If either of us used the toilet on the landing, we would sometimes hear what I can only describe as a deep male mumbling outside the door. This sometimes happened when either one of us was on our own in the house. Andy also experienced someone tapping on the door, which I also heard from downstairs. I frequently heard my name called from different parts of the house by a female voice. Stupidly, I did make my own Ouija board from paper and tried to contact the spirit to see what it wanted. Nothing happened, except that I felt very uncomfortable afterwards. So much so that I picked the makeshift Ouija up and put it in the rubbish bin outside. Two days later, the Ouija paper reappeared on my coffee table seemingly unmarked. This scared me so much that I then burnt it. I did question Andy, but he had no reason to go through the bin and would not have been remotely interested in the Ouija anyway. Around this time, I asked my dad to come over for lunch one day and he bought his dog a lovely big Akita with him. He was a very gentle dog who rarely growled and got aggressive. The dog was incredibly reluctant to come through the front door, and when he did, we couldn't make him move from a spot just below the staircase. He stood rigid, all fur on end, ears back and growled up at the stairs. He did this for about 20 minutes, and then yelped and ran into the front room. The cats were safely popped in the back room downstairs, and there was no one else in the house but me, my dad, and the dog. Andy would cycle home on an evening after work. Now as he cycled up the road, the side of the house would become visible. You could see the kitchen, the upstairs bathroom window, and also the window to our spare room upstairs. On this particular evening, I was cooking in the kitchen downstairs, and saw Andy's bicycle lamp approach from the road. I waved and he waved back and came inside. When he came in, he said, Oh, I didn't know you had your sister over. I was baffled as it was just me and told him so. He went white and told us that our upstairs spare room light was on and that he'd seen a figure pulled back against the curtains wave to him and then go behind the curtain. We both ran upstairs and of course there was no one there at all. Just the light on that I had not turned on. There are too many small things to list entirely. But some notable mentions are that Andy was having sleep paralysis one night and screamed awfully until I woke him up. He said he had seen a white figure approaching slowly up the bed. This has been the one time this has ever happened to him. 
our power box once switched off, even though the neighbors were fine. Our power switched off, even though the neighbors were fine. So we looked to our power box and switched it all back on and joked that it must have been the ghost. We went upstairs after this and it shut off again by itself. I also saw a lady in an old fashioned nurse's uniform in my dream. She walked into our bedroom and smiled at us. There was an ornament that was flying gently off the unit while I watched and then it landed gently to the floor. Towards the end of our tenancy, we had two things happen that stuck with me. It was a stressful time and the atmosphere was not great anyway. One night we were both in bed reading. On the back of our bedroom door was a hook and on the hook, I had hung a fairly large slate heart. We were reading quietly when we both suddenly looked up at the door. The heart started to swing upwards in the air as if someone were holding it and then slammed back down on the door so hard it made the frame shake. We both leapt up and checked the landing outside our bedroom. It was freezing cold and had an extremely unfriendly feel to it. On our very last day, we had help from Andy's parents. I had hung up the original pictures back on the wall in the front room. They were all very secure. I can't remember properly, but I believe that we had an altercation with a rude neighbor over parking and Andy and his mum got very agitated. We all stood in the hallway and there were some raised voices. Suddenly there was a huge crack from the front room. The pictures that I had just hung carefully were all on the floor. The string was intact as were the hooks that I'd hung them up on and we all made a hasty retreat. It's also worth mentioning that since we've lived there, the house has had quite a lot of different tenants who all seem to move out within a few months. Seems we're not the only one who were plagued by paranormal activity. This happened about seven-ish years ago when I was 17 and living independently for the first time since leaving the local children's home. The building I lived in was a very old stone cottage that was once used as a pigsty before being converted. On a caravan site that used to be a farm, the place was always freezing cold and always had a weird vibe about it. And a bunch of odd things happened there. But this was the main thing that stuck with me by far. At some point while living there, probably around the six month mark, I lost my keys. It didn't matter to me much because it was so out in the sticks in rural Wales, UK, that I felt I could confidently leave it unlocked with no bother, and I was able to get spare keys for the other ones that were on the ring. While not being too worried or thinking that finding them was very urgent, I did search the place from top to bottom several times over the next seven to eight months, but never found them, nor did I come across them when I organized cupboards, drawers, or moved furnitures around. They were completely gone. One morning I woke up around 10ish and came straight through to the kitchen. The place was a long rectangle with four rooms in a row from right to left. Bedroom, kitchen, bathroom and a tiny hallway with front door, living room to make myself a coffee as usual. And there, right in the middle of the kitchen counter in front of the coffee pot and the kettle, as if I had just left them there the night before, were my keys. As you can imagine, I was floored by the perceived nonchalance these inanimate objects were just sitting there with. And instantly my thoughts turned to sleepwalking, downright forgetfulness, etc. But I knew in the back of my mind that none of these explained it. I went to grab them and instantly dropped them because of the searing pain in my hand. They were hot, like metal baking trays straight out the oven hot, like they had been sitting under the sun on a corrugated metal roof all day in high summer heat. I made myself coffee, making sure not to touch them, and left them there all day and eventually picked them up and hung them on the hook next to the door and didn't lose them again. Some other strange things that happened are as follows. I would sometimes hear a woman crying outside my window during winter when there were no guests staying in the caravan or camping section of the park, which was in a different field anyway. Repeatedly, I'd wake up to find a suited man sitting on the end of my bed in the middle of the night. I'm not sure if it was a dream, but it never felt like one. 
Doors kept opening and closing that I knew were not opened or closed beforehand. Wardrobes being opened and things being dragged out of it while I was out of the room. This happened a lot. No matter how many things I stacked in there. The door on it was one of those that you had to push inward for it to release the catch and open outward, if you get what I mean. The TV would turn itself on and off. Flickering lights and bulbs breaking way more than normal. Extra cold and hot spots throughout the building, which I often walked through or felt forming and disappearing next to me. I used to sleep with an electric blanket under my bottom sheet and two or three blankets on top of me, and occasionally would wake up freezing with one or two of the top layers on the other side of the bedroom. There was no way I could have kicked them that far in my sleep. Once I woke up, with my bed a foot away from the wall. It was a diving bed with wheels. We are not in an area that experiences earthquakes or anything like that. So how did it move? I moved out when I was 17 and social services don't put kids there anymore due to some unrelated issues that I had with the landowner, which I am glad about in many respects. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. In summer vacation, I had to spend time with my grandparents for a while. Mind you, their house is in a remote village surrounded by a pretty dense forest. Overall, it just looks sketchy. I figured it wouldn't be any harm me spending some time there. So I just went there, unpacked my things and started chilling around. First day, no big deal. Second day, all good. Now the third day, different matter. During the day, I had to go get some things from the second floor in order to prepare the food. So I just started going up the stairs. Suddenly I heard some kind of low voice, like a whispering. It sounded completely silent, so I was not able to determine what it was. I just figured it would be the wind, or these kinds of echoes that sound inside our heads sometimes. You get me? I got the things, and down the stairs I went again. Now... That sound got louder. I still couldn't make out what it was, but it sounded every time I went down each stair. So now I was more suspicious. But even then, I just kept minding my own business. Night came and it was time to go to my room, which unfortunately enough was also on the second floor. I had completely forgotten about the sound, and the night was calm. So, this time, no wind or placebo effect could influence what I heard. And what I heard each time was when I took a step up the stairs was an elderly voice saying one, two, three. It freaked me out and I sprinted my way up the stairs. And so with every step I took, the voice followed me and kept counting of them at the same speed I was taking them, like encouraging me to go faster. And during that time, two things happened to me. First of all, I noticed that each sound was coming from each stair, which was creepy to say the least. And the second thing was my brain telling me, Adrian, whatever the hell you do, don't look back. Mind you, I've never agreed with something as much as I agreed with that advice. And I'm pretty sure I broke the record for how many stairs can be climbed in the least amount of time by a human being. Thinking about it now, why the hell did there have to be more than 30 stairs in order to get to the second floor? When I got to my room, I inadvertently started counting my heartbeats in the same way the voice counted the stairs. I loudly and annoyingly swore out loud, paranoid the voice had come into the room, but there was nothing but complete silence surrounding me. I didn't know what to do. Did I call my grandparents or flee the house before some spirit annihilates me while I sleep? Obviously I slept. I slept like a baby with the amount of mental stress the situation had put me under and all my energy faded away as I fell asleep in moments. But the next day in the morning, if you'd have told me I was scared of going down a few stairs, I would have laughed. But at that moment, it was a matter of life or death. I literally waited for my grandparents to wake up so that I could go down. And although nothing happened, for the rest of the day I was there, it still has left me quite freaked out. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for following me on Twitter, which most of you have already done. But you, yes you, haven't. You know what to do. 
You know where the link is. Just do it. Thanks, guys. For real. I hope you liked today's video. Haunted houses are one of my favorites. I say that a lot about paranormal stuff. But I just love spooky stories. There you go. Today is a special day indeed. Because it celebrates me and my wife being together 10 years. Not married, but, you know, just together as a couple. So that's pretty awesome. So this record... <laughs> So this video was recorded in advance so that I could have the day off. If you liked it, you know what to do. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And if you think it's follow me on Twitter, then definitely do that. Or Instagram. I'd like to extend a huge thanks, as always, to my lovely members and patrons who help keep the channel going by their contributions. It really does mean a lot, makes a hell of a lot of difference to me, because it just helps keep the channel churning along. So thank you so much to everyone. The names, of course, are on screen. But for now, guys, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.